Hello and welcome, this is Dawn back with another video for Honeybee. So today I'm going to show you watercolor two ways. We're going to do a soft vintage look and then we're going to do a more vibrant expressive version using the same stamp set. Personally, I think they are both just as beautiful, but it'll be up to you and your personal preference which style you prefer. So like I mentioned, we're going to be using the same sets. We're going to use the For the Girls and we're going to use the Spring Wreath. I thought that these would make gorgeous Mother's Day cards. For my paper, I'm using Stonehenge Aqua Cold Press. You can use whatever your favorite watercolor paper is. Now, if you have paper that comes on a block, some people uh, don't realize this is actually really easy to separate. It's gummed on all four sides. This particular one is gummed on all four sides. Some are only gummed on three sides. Some have a corner open. This one has a little open area right here at the top. I'm going to take my palette knife and I'm going to slide it between the sheets of paper and then just slide my palette knife all the way around. This is going to um, break that gumming and release the top sheet of paper. And you can choose to leave yours on the block while you're painting. However, I'm going to be using the misty, which means I need to put the paper in the misty. So I removed that top sheet. Now I've trimmed that down to five by five and then I'm going to stamp my image. I'm going to use Distress Ink in Antique Linen. This is still my preferred ink for no-line watercolor. When I'm doing no-line Copic color, I do like the no-line um, inks that are on the market, and Honeybee has a great one. But when it comes to watercolor, I like that the ink is water-soluble, and for the most part, it will not show in your finished product. But in areas where it does show, especially for the vintage version, I think that it actually adds to the charm. Now I am stamping this a couple of times because I'm working on cold pressed watercolor paper. It has a texture, so it's not going to give me a perfect impression. I just want to make sure that I have enough of the image there that I can follow along. So you can see here, the centers aren't perfect, but that's okay. I'm watercoloring this, so I don't need a perfect impression. To do my watercoloring, I'm using the Mungyo 48 pan watercolor here. This is my go-to set for all of my crafting watercolor, but you could easily get similar results using distress inks, distress oxides, or any of the other craft watercolors on the market. You can see here this has tons of colors and it is well loved. No, I don't clean my palette. <laughs> so for this version, I'm going to show you guys the two brush method. I'm going to be using the number two Princeton Heritage 4050 series round brush and the number five Princeton Velvet Touch round brush. And I've also got my cup of clean water and a paper towel here for blotting off. Now, for this one, I'm going to show you how to do, it's a two brush method. We're going to use one brush to lay down color, and we're going to use the second brush to pull or move that color around. All right, so I like to start with the centers of my flowers. There is nothing new there. Um, pretty much every method that I do, I'll start with the centers. And I've taken a little bit of yellow, and if you need to, go ahead and pull your stamp set into view where you can see it so you can exactly see what's going on in there if you didn't get a perfect impression. I am going to just dot, dot, dot in the center. Literally all it is. I'm taking a little bit of yellow and I put down a couple dots. Then I picked up a little bit of orange on that brush with the yellow and put a dot or two on one side. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the other flowers. Now I do like to drop color in while my paper is still wet. This is going to give me the most beautiful blend that um, I couldn't achieve any other way. Letting them blend together while they're wet is um, magical. So I've picked up a little bit of a brownish red and I'm dropping that very sparingly into one side of the centers of these flowers. And you can see how the water just carries that pigment into the other colors and you get this very soft transition. Again, it's really difficult to do that without dropping it in there while it's wet. Okay, so for the flowers themselves, um, I want coral, surprise, surprise, <laughs> but I want a vintage coral. So here I'm taking opera, opera pink, I think it is, or opera rose. I will have to double check that, hold on. It's opera pink. So this is a very, very, very bright pink. Um, not really going to fit with my vintage color palette. So now I'm adding a little bit of yellow ochre to it. Now yellow ochre is kind of a brownish yellow. Um, it's kind of a milky brownish yellow and it's going to knock that pink back some. 
It's gonna start pushing me towards that coral because we were adding that yellow, but it's also because it's a little bit muddier color, it's going to bring back some of the fluorescence of that opera. So here we're getting close and I wanna test it to see if I like the color. So I'm gonna grab a scratch piece of cardstock and I'm just gonna lay that down, kind of pull it out with a little water. It's a little more orangey than I want, so I'm just gonna add a little bit more opera to that, and now we are we are good. This is, this is what I'm looking for. And I know that when that dries back, it's gonna dry back a little bit lighter, so we're gonna go ahead and move forward with this color. So here is where you'll see the two brush method. I'm gonna lay down some pigment at the top and the bottom of a petal, then I'm gonna take the second brush here, this is the number two, and I'm using that to connect those two areas of pigment. So put down some pigment, pick up the other brush, and move that pigment around. Now the second brush, the brush that I'm moving the pigment with is just damp. It's not soaking wet, I've dunked it into my water, I've taken the excess water out on the paper towel, so it's what I would call a thirsty brush. So it's gonna pull and move that pigment that I lay down on the paper. This will help me control how much pigment I'm laying down. Since we're working with smaller areas here, um, I don't wanna risk getting the color too solid. So by just putting down a little bit of pigment and then using that damp brush to move and pull that pigment across the petals, I can ensure that I'm going to get variation in color. I'm gonna get some of those areas with the darker where it's got more pigment, and then I'm gonna have some areas where it's much lighter where it has more water than pigment. While it's still wet, again, I will come in and drop more pigment in areas where I want the pigment or the color to be darker, places where the um, petal itself would be darker, as if it was in shadow, so down deep towards the center of the flower, some areas on the edges of the petal. But as I move across and as I'm painting here, I'm keeping an eye on the area that I just painted because once the paper dries, I can't just drop new color in there. I'd have to re-wet it. So you'll see here in a second, as I'm working on this flower, I can see that there's an area where I can drop in some heavier pigment. So in, I'll actually jump over to that flower, drop a little heavier pigment in there, and then I'll come right back to this flower. Okay, so we are going to speed this up a little bit. Uh, I think this one took me about half an hour to do, which is a long time to find something interesting to say while I'm voicing this over, and I don't wanna keep you guys here all day, but I do want to give you a good idea of how to do this. So like I said, it is just the repetitive steps. Use one brush to lay down some pigment. Use another damp brush to move that pigment across the petals. It's very, very easy. And I, you can, you see here, I am not doing the method where you do one petal and then skip over and do another petal. I'm not um, worried about two wet areas being next to each other. For this, I want, I don't care if they bleed together. Um, it's, it's not important. I will separate any petals that I want separated with a second layer of color. Another thing that you're gonna notice is that um, these get better and better. So the first flower was kind of meh. By the time I get to this flower, it's looking more like I would want it to look as a finished product with just one layer and that is because I am warming up. I highly recommend that you do warm-ups. This, I didn't do any warm-up piece before. I just pulled it out, turned on the camera, and started filming. But again, this is a testament to how important it is to warm up because you can see the difference progressively between each flower that I did. The every Each flower got better than the last, and they look more like a final product than the first flower. So definitely, I cannot recommend enough to do a little warm-up piece. Okay, so I've moved on to the smaller flowers here. I put a little bit of yellow in the center, and then I added a little bit of brown to one side. And while I'm at it and I have that brown on my brush, I just added a few little dots to the centers of those original flowers. I've decided to use a kind of a violety purple, uh, yeah, more of a pinky purple for our littler flowers. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Lay down a dot or a little dot of pigment and then use the other brush to move that pigment out across the petals of the flowers. Now, for these littler flowers, I'm not being too careful about uh, making perfect petal shapes either. I'm, I'm just dragging the color out in a petal-ish shape. 
and I'm having the petals radiate from the circle. Again, I have a stamp there to go by, so it's really not, it's not that difficult. Add a few extra drops of color to the center and let that bleed out. And then again, over here for these other littler ones, a couple dots of color, use that damp brush to pull that color across the petals and then add a little bit more pigment to the center and let the water just let that flow out to the edges of the petals. Very, very simple. Okay, so I'm gonna let that dry just a minute and while I'm letting that just kind of dry a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and mix up my green, get ready to do my leaves. I'm using a little bit of sap green and then I have added a little bit of green gold to that and now I'm going to come in with that uh, burnt sienna and just add the tiniest bit to each of my flower centers. This is just going to add those deepest darks and give me some good contrast. Then I'll let this dry and it's time to come in and do all of our, our greenery. Now I've mixed up a green but it is just a little too vibrant so I'm adding a little bit of that burnt sienna to that green and that's going to knock it back just a bit. And this is perfect. We're going to do the leaves the exact same way that we did the flowers. So I'll start off by picking up some of my uh, pigment here on my smaller brush and I'm going to add a little bit of that to the paper and then I'm going to use that damp larger brush to pull that pigment across the leaf shape. I am going to try to refrain from fussing with this too much and just trust the process. But doing it this way will give me a more spontaneous look and it will result in some beautiful, um, some beautiful blends and bleeds that I couldn't, I, I wouldn't be able to emulate without just letting the water do the work. A little bit of pigment, use that damp brush to just pull that pigment across the petal. Add in a little bit of heavier pigment here and there and then leave it alone, walk away. <laughs> Not walk away, but move on to another leaf. Now I'm gonna use two different greens in this. So for all of the larger, more traditional looking leaves, I'm using this green. And then for the, um, what looks to be a different type of leaf in this wreath, I'm gonna use more of a blue green. I say it every time, but Definitely try to change up the tone or the shade of your colors that you're using in your watercolor. So don't use the exact same shade of pink for all your flowers or the exact same shade of green for all of your leaves. Definitely mix it up. You could even drop in the complementary color. For example, while I have the green loaded here on my brush, I could swipe through that pink and then use that to paint my leaves and that would be actually beautiful it'd be gorgeous because red's the opposite of green so it would actually knock that green back and make it less vibrant in certain spots but it wouldn't be completely changing the color so it would just add some um i don't want to say movement but yeah movement of color within each individual leaf which again is something that you couldn't do you couldn't imitate that if you tried it would be something that just happens spon spontaneously the way the water would mix those pigments together as you put it on the paper and it's absolutely beautiful in fact i will have to do a video on that i'll maybe i'm going to put that on my to-do list we're going to do a video on that so here i was talking about adding the blue to the green to give me just a slightly different shade of green so that's what i've done here i added a little bit of i think it was cobalt blue to the green mixture that i already had and that just leaned it a little more a little more blue green here i've realized that i'd missed one of those small purple flowers while i was painting my uh, greenery there so i'm just filling that in now and then i will continue to go around and fill in all of the rest of the greenery here now i'm going to show you a couple and then i'm just going to um, speed ahead to where all of it's done because again it's repetitive but i'm making sure to vary how I'm varying the strength of pigment that I'm putting down. So sometimes I will use more pigment, sometimes I will use less pigment and more water. And that again is just going to add that variation in all of the leaves. 
And we're looking pretty good here, but we can make this look even better by adding in a little bit of detail with a second layer of color. And we're not gonna do it to everything. We're just gonna pick areas where we can add a little bit more detail to make things pop. So like right here in the middle of these flowers, I wanna add almost a glow. So I'm adding a semicircle of a red and then I'm using my wet brush to just soften that out. And it's gonna cause that red to glaze over that yellow and it's gonna go from red to orange to yellow and it adds almost, it almost looks like it's glowing. Okay, so now we can add a little bit of detail to our pink flowers. And I wanna deepen up this coral just a little bit. So I'm adding the tiniest bit of the green from our leaves to that coral color that was on our palette. Again, green is the opposite of red, which our coral leans more red. So it's going to knock that color back a little bit, mute it, if you will, make it look like it is coral in shadow. And I'm adding a little bit of that to the back petals of this flower. So this particular flower is facing up so we can't see the center of the flower and those front petals are folded towards us. So I'm adding deeper color to the base of those front petals and I'm leaving the part where the petals are folded towards us. I'm leaving that untouched. That's gonna stay very light. And then I'm adding deeper color to the base of those back petals. This is going to make that flower look more cup-like so it has shadows inside where the flower goes down into the center and then the front petals are in shadow with the tips of the petals folding towards us. And then on this flower, again, we're just gonna add a little bit of that deeper color there in the center of the flower. Give this a more cup-like appearance as well. This one isn't facing completely up, but it is up and tilted just a little. So we're gonna add a little bit of depth to the center there. and just a little bit to some of the petals to make them look like they are behind the others. Again, just adding in those little bits of shadows can help separate petals from each other and help us force the um, viewer to see it facing the direction that we want it to be. So um, it makes it appear more like it's upturned a little. Again, here a little bit more of that shadow on this flower. This one was the first one we painted and she, remember she wasn't my favorite anyway. So here I am trying to salvage her, make her look a little bit better. So add a little bit of deeper color toward the center, trying to reinforce that cup shape. And then the last flower, I really like the way it looks and I didn't need to do very much to that at all. Again, just reinforce that cup shape make it look like that center was recessed just a bit. And that was pretty much it. She's, I was happy with how she looked. And I will do the same thing to all the other elements in the wreath that I feel need it. Um, I didn't do it to all of them, just a little bit here and there. And again, here you can see, I'm just adding a little bit of darker color here and there to the leaves. Sometimes I'll leave it hard. Sometimes I'll use the damp brush to soften it out. But for the most part, I just want to add a few spots of deeper color here and there. And then that finishes up the painting portion for this one. Now for the next one, this is the more expressive version and it goes quite a bit faster than th this one does anyway. But I'm throwing it into fast motion because I do have a video that I just recently did on this technique and I will link it in the description box below. I wanted to leave the full process in here but spread up pretty quickly for those who may be interested in this style and maybe missed that video. So you can see how this one comes you can see this one come together and then if you want to learn more about how to do this style you can definitely go watch that video like i said this one definitely goes faster overall it takes um i want to say this one took me less than 15 minutes to do from start to finish it's where we're just using the stamp as a guide and we are allowing our brush to pretty much make all of the instead of filling in the petals or filling in the leaves we're making those shapes with our brush we're using the belly of our brush to create the shapes by dragging the brush across the paper i'm not waiting for things to dry so i'm allowing colors to bleed into each other again this is this a little more loose a little more expressive 
and it's a lot of fun and it's a little different look if uh, you like watercolor but uh, you don't have the patience to I don't want to say paint because we're painting here this is actually more you're using your brush to paint rather than coloring with your brush but it definitely takes less patience it's a little more fun it's a little more free and you get um you sometimes you get a little more surprises that turn out absolutely gorgeous so it's definitely a fun one to try and like i said if you're interested in this one check the link below once this first layer dries i will come in with a second layer so here you can see i'm coming in with a second deeper color and i'm laying that on top of what i just did not covering everything up i'm just adding almost accenting strokes to the um, to the base layer this will create depth and interest and personally this is one of my favorite styles we'll do the same thing to the flower here you can see i've picked up a heavy darker pigment of that um, magenta color and I'm just adding in some extra strokes and petals on top of what I had already done. A few little darks to the centers there. And a darker layer for the little blue flowers as well. Now this one I will finish off with some splatters because you know I love splatters. And then this one is done. And so here we have our two versions side by side. Now it's just time to turn these into cards. Now for both of these cards, I'm gonna use the, uh, this one's for the girls stamp set. This is a great stamp set, you guys. Do not sleep on this. They have every, they have, I mean, you've got mom, mother, stepmom, bonus mom, sister, Mimi, Abuelita, Tia, um, granny, Grammy, madre, abuela, wife. I mean, everything you could think of as your sub sentiments that you could give a Mother's Day card to. Uh, the other great thing is that you could pair these sub sentiments with like just a general happy birthday or thinking of you. So this is a good one to put in your stash, you guys. This is a really good one. And you may have noticed that I stamped this a couple of times. That is because I'm stamping on that cold pressed watercolor paper, which is textured. I wanted my whites to match. So that's why I stamped it a couple of times. I'm using the coordinating die here. The die set comes with two dies to fit the largest uh, main sentiment, which is with love um, on Mother's Day, I believe, and happy Mother's Day. I'm also gonna cut that die uh, two more times just from cardstock so that I can stack them on top of each other just to give my sentiment a little height and separate it from that wreath. Now I loved the vintage vibe going here and I liked how clean this was, but I did want to add a little something something to this without distracting from the actual painting itself. So I went back and forth and I was going to stitch the edges and then I decided, you know what? I'm going to tear the edges. I'm going to do a deckled edge. Now this is something that you will see very often in watercolor. Uh, a lot of your watercolors have that torn edge uh, especially if you buy them in loose sheets, they'll have the torn edge. And this is really easy to achieve. If you have a decal trimmer, which will cut this faux deckled edge, you can do that. But this is very easy and you don't need any special tools. You just need a straight edge. Here, I'm using my T-square ruler. And you can see here, I'm having a little trouble with it because my sons broke one side of that T-square, so. <laughs> I've got like half a T-square ruler. And you're gonna use that straight edge to measure one quarter inch. That's what I'm doing. I'm doing one quarter inch. I'm grabbing that free edge of the paper. And you can see here, because I'm doing only a quarter of an inch, it's hard to get a hold of that. But once you get it, you're gonna pull up and into the straight edge. Now this first side is, it's giving me a little bit of trouble. Let's be honest, I can't hide it, it's on camera. It's giving me a little bit of an issue. However, the next three sides go super easy. And if you are having trouble, just give yourself a, a larger edge to grab, right? So if I would have went in half an inch, I'd have plenty of paper to grab and rip towards the roller, or the roller, the ruler or the straight edge. But since I didn't wanna lose too much of my paper here, I went with a quarter of an inch. So I'm using my grid mat underneath. I'm lining my panel here up using that straight edge or that half straight edge of my T-square ruler here. 
making sure that I've got a quarter of an inch, then I'm gonna grab the edge of that paper and again, pull towards me and towards the ruler. So you can see that I'm pulling towards me and towards the ruler. And the edge of that ruler or a straight edge, whatever you're using will keep your line straight. You won't rip beyond the ruler. And if you're having trouble grabbing it, I just use my tweezers to kind of turn up that edge and then I can grab onto that and rip it the rest of the way. So I love, I love the look this gave and I didn't have to pull out my sewing machine. I do love a good sewn edge as well, but this gave me that nice vintage look and it doesn't distract from the watercolor. It actually complements it very well. Plus, like I said, I have my mother in mind for this one and I know that she will love this card. I mounted it to a craft card base with a little bit of fun foam behind it just to pop it up a little. And then I'm finishing it off with a few honeybee stamps, pearls, and I will have the exact ones that I use listed in the description box below. I can't remember offhand, but I'll link them below. All right, so let's take a look at both cards. And here they are. You can see this is the first one that we did in the more vintage style. And I kept everything very simple, soft colors. Love those pearls with this. And again, I love that deckled edge. And you could achieve this with a trimmer, but like I said, if you don't have a trimmer, it's easy to use with a straight edge. Now for the more vibrant, expressive version, which is gonna be great for my sister, I finished that off with some honeybee gems on this one because I just thought that it needed all of that colorful sparkle to match with that colorful, vibrant wreath. All right, so I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, leave it in the comments below. I will be sure to check and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye.